All right, so I'm, let's let's kick this off. All right, that's Madeline hitting the record button. It always startles Sorry. me a bit, but I got it. All right, so just so you all know, we're, we are recording for posterity. So welcome to the first post free fall society's monthly Zoom room meeting. We are an organization of individuals who prefer science and reason over religious dogma and fanaticism. Uh, we've enjoyed the non-religious community of Northeast Florida since 1998, and we are now in our 24th year. Today, we commemorate Martin Luther King Jr., who would be 93 years alive had he lived. He was shot in Memphis at the Lorraine Motel on April 4th, 1968. He was 39 years alive. Dr. King was a Baptist minister and an activist leader of the civil rights movement from 1955 until his assassination. Slavery, separate but equal, boycotts, voting, voting rights, assassinations, equality, justice. Reverend King advanced civil rights through nonviolence and civil disobedience, inspired in part by his Christian beliefs and the nonviolent activism of Mahatma Gandhi, who was also assassinated. Dr. King's courage far, far outweighed his vulnerabilities. His fight against white supremacy, racism, and inequality, for, and his fight for dignity and human respect continues. Among his many efforts, King founded and headed the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Through his activism and inspirational speeches, he played a pivotal role in ending legal segregation in the United States. He deserves the highest praise for the creation of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, events just a short lifetime ago. Dr. King won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1964. He continues to be remembered as one of the most influential and inspirational humanitarian leaders in history. It's a moving and emotional visit to the Lorraine Motel. And now it's known as the National Civil Rights Museum. If you haven't been, I encourage you to go. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. The time is always right to do what is right. Both of those were said by Dr. King. But there's the rub. How do we decide what is right? Well, I'll share something that feels right. The First Coast Free Thought Society is aligned with the goals of Martin Luther King. We're online. We're on Facebook. Twitter, Meetup, and Instagram. We have Secular Sunday in the Park, book and movie discussion groups, and the Free Thinker newsletter. We encourage your submissions. Our website is firstcoastfreethoughtsociety.org. Now I have a question. Is there anybody here who is new to the First Coast Free Thought Society? And if so, may I ask how, how did you hear about us? We, are you willing to share that? If you are, speak. If not, that's okay, too. I'm new. <laughs> Mabel. Mabel's Mabel. Mabel. Hi, Mabel. Welcome. Are you willing to share how you heard about us? And what uh, drove searching. Um, I recently, as of maybe summertime, I started to question many, many things. And then I realized it's my my religion, you know, that my religion background that um, that is what I was question uh, what I was questioning the most and pretty much my whole life. But um, I always thought it was wrong um, to question anything. Um, but I decided to break from that and I started looking for people who has the same thinking. So then I started looking for groups here in Jackson that I have not been able to meet yet in any of the, I think the Sun Sundays meetings that they have, but soon <laughs> we'll do it. But yeah, that's how I was, I got into this forum here. Well, well, well thank you for sharing that, Mabel. I'm glad you mm -hmm. found us. Uh, um, you can check us out on our website, 
and learn more about us if you haven't already done that. And I'm, I'm hopeful mm -hmm. you'll be able to enjoy tonight's presentation with, with, mm -hmm. with Eric. Uh, we're looking forward to it. So thank you. Anybody else want to share something that uh, uh, if you have not been here before, um, you care to share how you heard about us? Yeah, okay. this is my first time here too. Eric, <laughs> how did you hear about us, Eric? I heard about you through Mark and Jeanette. And oh, I was so oh. excited to learn that there was a secular community in uh, Jacksonville, Florida. Okay, fantastic. Well, welcome, Eric. We hope you'll have <laughs> something to say to us later. We're getting ready to get to you, Mr. Wells, soon. Um, but look, I appreciate everybody. Listen, we're all volunteers here. Everybody here is a volunteer. Nobody gets paid. Nothing's going on here other than we're trying to make a difference with what we are trying to do. But we do incur expenses, largely promotion. We promote it online, on the radio, and in print. And if you know of a viable place for us to share a promotion, please share that with us. For example, if you know of an email list, we could send an introductory promotional email to or on, we would be happy to try to find a beneficial way to do it. Um, we don't want the email, just one or two of our promotional emails to be sent through your list. There are also associated costs for our website and our fees for regulatory compliance as a 501c3 organization. Now, if you, if you can see your way clear to a 20, 30, $50, $100 donation, we would be most grateful. And for now, this year, for the first time ever, as you can see behind me, we are offering t-shirts for everybody who donates $100 or more. We'll send you one of these beautiful t-shirts, blue, yellow, green, black, you know, basically any color you want. Uh, tell us your size, your mailing address, and your preference of color, and we'll send you one of those. You can check out the details on our website under the tab, t-shirts. Uh, we'd be happy to send you one for $100 or more as a donation. We much appreciate your, uh, your, your contribution, your participation, and your support. Um, without your support, our outreach doesn't go very far. So tonight, tonight, we are pleased to welcome Eric Wells. Jeanette Emerson is our vice president and our program coordinator. So Jeanette, would you do the honors of introducing Eric? Absolutely. First, I just wanted to remind you that, well, first I just wanted to say um, how much I'm looking forward to an exciting year because I think some of the directions Ken is taking us are so appropriate and hopefully will we'll really land us in a really good place. And I'm working really hard to get some really excellent presenters uh, to speak for us. I'm, I wanted to get some, I'm doing some research on some folks who are interested in doing a presentation on COVID, specifically from the medical side. Um, and when I say that, I mean from the RNA who can explain how it was developed and et cetera. The second thing I just wanted to remind everyone is to mute your phones while Eric is speaking. And to remind everybody that you, we are being, um, this, this is being recorded. So um, if you, if you don't want to, if you don't want your presence, if you ask questions and you don't want your face to be seen, you might want to change your background to something else. Um, any questions that you have, Eric's ha going to have to leave a little early. You can send them to me. I'll try and get my email address in the chat and I will make sure to follow up with Eric if I can't answer them myself after he's gone. But for now, let's go ahead and get the show on the road as we're running out of time here with Eric. Um, Eric is um, with the Recovering from Religion. He is, he is a director for the Recovering, for, if I can say this right. He's a director for the support group for recovering from religion. And that's how I met Eric. Um, Mark and I facilitate a recovering from religion support group here in Jacksonville and in Tallahassee. So take it away, Eric. All right. Hi folks. Thank you so, so much for inviting me here to speak with you guys. And um, it's just an honor also to uh, kick off 
both 2022 with uh, you folks, as well as um, sharing Martin Luther King's uh, day with you guys too. I'm really, really excited about this. Um, so I am the support group director for Recovering from Religion, just like uh, Jeanette had said. And today I'm going to talk to you about Recovering from Religion. And this presentation is entitled Meeting the Unmet Need of Religious Trauma. So first off, I'm just going to go ahead and introduce you to or introduce myself to you and I'd, uh, I'm a, a general contractor. I also love doing genealogy work. Um, and believe it or not, I'm a humanist celebrant. I've married several folks and really, really love it and performing secular ceremonies for those folks. So many C's in there and S's. <laughs> I stumble over them. And like I said at the beginning, I'm a support group director for Recovering from Religion. You'll hear me use the initialism RFR, uh, both as I'm talking and kind of during the presentation. And that stands for Recovering from Religion, as you might imagine. But before that, um, so I'm coming from you live from Colorado Springs, Colorado. But before that, my wife and I were in the Springfield, Missouri area. And as I was kind of transitioning out of religion and uh, starting to find myself uh, as a non-believer, um, I really plugged into the local secular community out there and uh, attached myself to the Springfield Skeptics group that are out there and um, worked as the activism director and eventually as the executive director for that group was such a fascinating and fantastic experience for me. Um, I also did uh, uh, volunteer and all this is kind of volunteer work. I also volunteered as the state um, director for American Atheists for Missouri State. I uh, went to Jackson, uh, Jefferson City uh, several times to kind of talk uh, to some committees about horrible bills that they were trying to pass. I worked with local uh, cities and counties to um, uh, keep them in line with uh, uh, not sh showing favoritism to a particular religion. Um, I can imagine, uh, you would imagine what type of religion I'm talking about. Uh, and I'm also a former Recovering from Religion support group leader. Uh, I did the, the work that Jeanette and Mark are currently doing, and I've done that in the past um, for the past six years now. Um, it's just been very, very fulfilling for me. But I wasn't always a non-believer. I was kind of born into a Baptist family and really wholeheartedly just jumped into that religion because that's how I thought the world would work uh, worked. And as a kid, I thought like, well, why doesn't isn't everybody a Christian? I got to do my job and to bring souls into heaven. But as I began to uh, turn into a teenager, I started asking questions of my pastor and youth pastor and the people around me and the answers I was getting back was not matching up at all with what I was learning in school. And honestly, those answers weren't really making a lot of sense either. I was also beginning to notice that uh, the people in the church would treat minorities differently. They treat women uh, differently. like, uh, And then they also treated um, uh, folks of the LGBTQ community differently. Uh, and I didn't really quite understand and couldn't square how a religion that was uh, professed to be of compassion and love and acceptance would uh, treat these these groups of people um, differently and uh, almost as um, outcasts in some sense or lesser than and uh, it just didn't make sense so um, really at about 16 I left the uh, Christian religion but I was wanting that uh, there to be an afterlife so badly it was something that I was so afraid of death and so I kept searching from one religion to another trying to find which one was the true one that and, and also had that promise of an afterlife whether it was in heaven or a reincarnation or what have you but about 11, 12 years ago, um, I had a very beloved pet pass away. My wife and I don't have kids. We pour all of our loves into our, our dogs. And um, she passed away of bone cancer. And uh, um, just whatever whatever reason, that moment kind of triggered and tr uh, uh, was this, this moment of one day I'm a, uh, I'm a spiritual, I believe in all the supernatural and the higher deity. And then, then right after that, I, I could no longer believe it. it. It really wasn't a choice for me and sent me into an existential crisis. And 
uh, for four years, I was in a pretty depressed state because I felt so alone in uh, the, the buckle of the Bible Belt in southwest Missouri, surrounded by conservative people. I was a um, self-employed, and so I was worried about my livelihood. I was worried about my wife's livelihood, worried I would leave, uh, I would lose friends and family because I no longer believed in um, any sort of deity. Um, but uh, finding a community uh, just like uh, this one here, finding community really helped me kind of come out of my shell, understand I wasn't alone, and um, began to kind of rebuild and reassemble some uh, sort of a worldview as I now began to understand where I was at. Uh, and uh, So that's, that's, I guess, a lot about me, but it kind of goes to set up um, why recovering from religion is so important and the work they do is so important to, to me personally. But RFR, it was founded in 2009. We're not quite a teenager yet. Um, we'll be a 13-year-old this year. And it was founded by Dr. Daryl Ray. And he is the author of The God Virus. And uh, he's also the author of Sex and God. Um, so after he published The God Virus, he started to receive a lot of letters from people, both thanking him for writing the book and uh, the people felt like they were no longer alone and they understood what they were going through. But they also wrote him saying, hey, I'm suffering, I'm in pain, I need help. What can I do? Where can I go? And at the time, he all he could do was uh, point them towards professional therapy, professional counseling. But then he couldn't even promise that those folks would be secular. They might uh, have a religious bent, uh, religious background, a religious um, push to what they were trying to, um, how they were trying to practice. Um, so he had this idea, well, why don't we just get together and, and see who's local in this Kansas City area and, and talk about what we've been through. Uh, so he put an event on Meetup and at, uh, said, hey, come here to this IHOP at this time at this day and let's let's talk about this. And 11 people showed up to that very first meeting. It wasn't marketed. It wasn't pushed anywhere else, but this one Meetup uh, group. And he asked the question, how has religion hurt you? And they talked for so long and IHOP was just tired of it. And they're like, "We, you guys have got to go. We're closing down. We guys have got to go. So it was something that Dr. Ray identified as an unmet need. Oh my gosh, we can have this uh, conversation. We can create groups and have these conversations around how religion has hurt us. And um, so that's really the mission of, of recovering from religion. But I also wanted to talk about religious trauma syndrome. A lot of therapists, a lot of counselors aren't really well trained. And in fact, it's something that's just recently begun to be uh, studied and explored in a, in a very serious scientific and professional manner. So it's kind of asked the question, how has religion hurt you? And then we can define religious trauma as experiencing trauma in either uh, either in or transitioning out of religion. And it can be from experiencing prolonged abuse from indoctrination or even from leaving the religion, uh, the religious group um, or worldview and a combination of both. So you can kind of see that wide spectrum of how religious trauma can occur. Uh, the psychologist Marlene Wynell really was the one who kicked this off and coined the term religious trauma. Just, I think, 2011 was really one of the first serious studies where uh, brought it to light. And some of the symptoms are um, pretty wide ranging. It's both, uh, it's all this emotional, intellectual, psychological, even interpersonal, social, and sexual issues can arise from religious trauma syndrome as well. But when uh, people experience this, where do they go to uh, um, talk about their doubts or their non belief when it really comes to religion? I know that. On one side of uh, the uh, religious spectrum, I can go to my religious community, talk to my pastor, talk to my imam or rabbi about what's been going on, talk to my friends and family who I also go to church with about these doubts. Um, on the other side, when I'm out of religion, I have a bunch of groups, secular communities I can talk to, um, the atheist community of discord, a huge community of, of non-believers. Uh, I can listen to 
a non-believing podcast, like uh, Thinking Atheist or Atheist Experience. I've got all these resources um, on both sides of, of the spectrum, but there's this middle part that where if I'm starting to doubt, starting to really not believe, I don't feel safe going to my religious community or, and I definitely won't be feel safe going to my even, or even be aware that there are people who know, who don't believe uh, and that I can approach because of the propaganda that um, has been uh, uh, issued by the, the religious community about how awful atheists are. So there's this middle zone that really isn't addressed as much. Uh, and that's that middle zone is where recovering from religion uh, shines and uh, provides a ton of different services. Oh, uh, I just kind of talked about that. <laughs> um, like I said, joining a secular group may not feel safe or in going back to religion may not feel uh, safe at all. Um, and, and there's this other aspect too, that a lot of community groups aren't, um, and even uh, counselors and therapists aren't quite trained um, to handle or don't have the systems set up to handle. It's the years on, um, when we transition out of religion, it's not like a switch is flipped. Like one day um, I, I'm operating from within a, a believer's worldview and the next day I'm operating out of a non-believer's worldview. And, and you know, it's not like I, I have a political affiliation with one party on uh, one day and a political affiliation with another party the another day. It's, it's a gradual transition. And as we experience certain events in our life, it begin, it can trigger some old behavior, some old thought patterns that we compare to our new non-believing worldview. And we're like, oh my gosh, uh, I've been carrying this around. How do I, like, for example, a view on LGBTQ individuals or a view on certain politicians, those things can shift or uh, uh, political um, uh, agendas, like, uh, I don't know, like how, how to work with homelessness or uh, or welfare or something. Our views can change drastically as we transition out of religion because so much of it is tied into what we've been told by our religious community. So how do we deal with those issues that come up over the long term? I know that I've been out um, of, uh, transitioned out of religion for 12 or so years now, but there are still things that crop up from my religious background that I uh, uh, deal with. I kind of envision it as a garden and there's these weeds that pop up every now and then the things that I don't want, I want to grow tomatoes or green beans, but there's these weeds and grasses or that I've got to kind of deal with and, and clean out on a regular basis. So that's, that's the gap that RFR is feel, filling. So I'm going to tell you the mission for recovering from religion. Our mission, which I love, I love saying this sentence, our mission is to provide hope, healing, and support to those struggling with issues of doubt and non-belief. We have got a ton of programs to uh, work towards that goal of uh, providing hope, healing, and support to those folks who are struggling with doubt and non-belief. And I've got several listed here, Helpline, the Resources Program, the Secular Therapy Project, Support Groups, Online Community, and the Outreach Program as well. I'll go through them one by one. And, all right, so let's first start off with the helpline program. The, um, I've got this for the first three, the, the three main programs that we have, I kind of have set up a medical analogy to hopefully uh, illustrate the need that the program serves. So for the helpline, you can imagine this is like an emergency room. This is, I'm, I'm going through my existential crisis now. I don't know who to talk to. My religious community isn't safe. I'll get shunned. My, and all of those secular folks are scary as hell. So who the heck do I talk to? I really need to talk to someone now. This is a crisis. So I kind of imagine it as the emergency room. So as an individual, as a person going through this, right, uh, this existential crisis, I have access to 24-hour a day, seven day a week, uh, a, a helpline that can be used for these immediate crisis situations that can be used to um, express my doubts, to ask questions about uh, my, my belief system and, and where, where it doesn't match up, what, what I'm concerned about. Um, and I can also use this helpline as a way to locate resources too. 
uh, um, I'm trans and I'm, I'm, I, I, I feel like uh, I'm a male, but I feel like I'm in a female's body. Who do I talk to? And so the, the agent at the helpline is able to provide some resources here. Try this, um, try this organization. I think that they might be able to help you or try this other organization. They might be able to be uh, perfect for what you're going through. Um, no, it's it's just fantastic, and these agents are uh, well trained to not to to address the people uh, and and the situation that they're coming towards for the, to the helpline for. Um, it's not a place where the volunteers will be talking about themselves or sharing their own personal stuff, but this is really a place for empathetic listening, um, for uh, non biased reflection, um, and to because. When a person is going through this, they it's just been bouncing around in their head the whole time. They they don't they can't talk to anybody about it. So this may be the very very first time that they're able to get their thoughts out uh, um, uh, verbally, get it out of their head, and uh, to someone else who is safe to talk to. The hotline can be reached, or the helpline can be reached through two different ways. People can call in, and we call that the the hotline. People can call. We've got toll-free numbers around the world, in uh, the U.S., in Canada, Australia, um, in South Africa, and uh, the U.K. Uh, people can call on their phone and reach the helpline. They can also go to our website, recoveringfromreligion.org, click on a call button, and the, through their browser, um, they'll be connected that way as well. Over just voice, docs will talk to a human being, not necessarily an automated person. If some, if a human a volunteer isn't available at the moment, they're able to schedule a time, and the and the volunteer can connect with them at that time. There's a second way to reach them is through the chat. And again, that's through the recoveringfromreligion.org website. At the bottom corner, there's these chat bubbles. You can click on it and type in what you're concerned about, and there'll be an agent on the other end of the line ready to respond and be there for you and provide the resources that, the resources that you need. Right now, we are averaging about 400 calls and chats per month. That's 400 people reaching out to us in search of something, in, in need of something, and in, in searching for help. So that's quite a bit. And we've got maybe close to 200 volunteers kind of working um, uh, in that helpline, volunteering in their helpline. When I say working, I really mean volunteering. No one at RFR is getting paid. We are all uh, volunteering and doing this because uh, for various reasons, and I've got my reasons. Uh, I'll talk about that a little later, but I would encourage you, uh, you know, after this uh, discussion, after the meeting, head to recoveringfromreligion.org and try out the chat line, try out the helpline yourself. Uh, you can kind of see how it works and how it um, operates from the inside, uh, because if you can kind of understand it a little bit better, you might be able to, in the future, if need be, provide this as a resource for somebody else. All right. The next uh, program that the Recovery from Religion offers is the support groups. Okay, I'm not biased or anything, but I love the support groups. <laughs> Being a support group leader for six years, I love the support groups. <laughs> it's kind of, so I'll take it back. I'm a little biased. But the support groups, let's continue the, the medical analogy. The support groups, it's like seeing your doctor, seeing your uh, general practitioner for regular checkups. You can kind of uh, like the doctor would ask you, like, what's going on? Um, what do, would you like to work on between these checkups? This is, in my view, instead of the immediate crisis, the, the um, I have to talk to somebody now. This is where the long term work and the long term healing can be fostered. These are these meetings, these support group meetings are a safe space created by the support group leaders like Jeanette and Mark for folks to talk about their personal struggles, their doubts, and the things that are starting to change with them, the things that they're starting to experience as they're um, experiencing these doubts, going through these doubts, or going through this transition out of religion. I got to say that off, um, recovering from religion has no intent of the deconverting folks. It's not at all the purpose. Instead, we're just here to listen and be empathetic um, and just be a safe space for folks to, to share what's going on in their head. 
Uh, so many times people are going to go back to their religion. Many times they're going to transition out of religion into, just, into something else, um, whether it's a non-belief or some other religion. Um, it doesn't really matter to us. That's not the purpose at all. Um, both the helpline that I talked about previously and the support groups, this is peer support. No one is, the training does not involve any professional support that a counselor or a therapist would be able to utilize at all. This is simply excellent communication, excellent listening skills. That's what we're, uh, the training as a support group leader or a helpline agent, that's what the training really is all about. Um, similar to the helpline, the support group leaders, their training focuses on reflective listening and empathetic responses and um, providing resources as well. But contrary to the helpline, the leaders, uh, like myself, uh, having led a support group in Springfield, Missouri, um, uh, I co-hosted with my, a good friend, Alex, who got me into and introduced to recovering from religion. I'll be forever in his debt. So by contrary to the helpline, um, we're uh, support group leaders aren't just like separate entities like let's say a social worker who's never done drugs but is leading a narcotics synonymous type of group no it's it's a lot different than that um many of us support group leaders have gone through our experience our, our religious trauma and, and uh, transitioning experience and so we can use this as a place to uh, share what's going on with us as well to kind of air out what we're going through um, I always, uh, as a, when I train new support group leaders, I always encourage them if they feel safe to be vulnerable, to kind of set the example. You don't have to, as a support group leader, have all the answers. Um, and it really is kind of a freeing thing. Once, uh, once I figured that out so many years ago, um, it was really kind of freeing <laughs> just to um, both be there for people and, and hear them. And then also to be heard. We have, 64 support groups around the world. Um, uh, the United States, there's the most of them are in there. We have um, Canada, there's several groups in Canada, Australia, Mexico, the UK, uh, and Croatia. We have a brand new group uh, in Croatia that's serving the whole Baltic area. I'm really excited about that. I think as that group grows, we may actually have a support group meeting in Russian. Mexico City right now, their support group meeting is in Spanish. Uh, it's just, it's really cool how quickly we've grown. We also have a virtual chapter, and that chapter is uh, serving areas that aren't geographically based, uh, that we, that we, that, that virtual chapter is not geographically based, so it's serving areas that there isn't a support group currently in there. Um, all of these support groups, except for the two virtual chapters that we have, are geographically based. That doesn't mean that uh, you have to be from that place to attend the meeting, like a Seattle uh, Recovering from Religion Support Group or Baltimore Recovering from Religion Support Group. Um, but once, uh, and, and um, uh, so we have that virtual chapter that's kind of designed to, as the catch all for folks who aren't nearby a geographical group. We also have a women's virtual chapter, uh, which uh, started this year. Oh, no, last year. And I was really excited about this one. It's something that I'm never going to attend because, as you can clearly see, I identify as a man. But if there are folks who identify as female or non-binary or gender fluid, those this group is for them. Because um, from what I'm told, and it totally makes sense, if there is a group of uh, mixed genders um, there are some women who may not feel comfortable talking about certain topics and so uh, in, uh, with a mixed uh, group. And so we have set up a specific group and a specific space for uh, folks to feel comfortable in. As you can kind of see, this is really all about creating that safe space. Each group uh, meets at least once a month for two hours. Several groups are meeting twice a month. Uh, really is up to the support group leader and because they're volunteering their time. Um, and we have requests to set up support groups all over the world, but we just don't have uh, volunteers in there until a volunteer steps up, let's say in South Africa to lead a support group. We won't be able to set one up there. So that's kind of how it runs. All right, next. Boy, I feel like I'm talking a lot. Um, if I need to slow down, uh, let me know in the chat. <laughs> Next is the Secular Therapy Project, or um, the initialism STP. 
And for me, the medical analogy here would extend to the secular therapy project is like seeing a specialist. This is, uh, I need to see something more than what the emergency room can do, something uh, more than what um, your general practitioner, your, your family doctor can do. I need to see an oncologist. I need to see a neurologist because there is more, something more than I need to work on than just what peer support can offer. So I need professional support, professional help. So, um, cause, and so what the secondary therapy project does, this was set up to be a directory, be a connection point between myself as a client and someone who has been vetted to be a secular therapist. These folks, um, these counselors, these professional therapists, uh, mental health uh, professionals are screened to ensure that they have the proper licensing in their state or country to make sure that they maintain a secular practice. And that's important. I'll tell you why in a minute. And also to make sure that they use, um, uh, uh, provide evidence-based therapies. Their um, uh, practice is solely evidence-based. So uh, someone won't send me home, a therapist won't send me home with crystals to put on my chakras or something. But going back to the secular practice, I um, spent, I think, five sessions and probably five or six hundred dollars to uh, sit down and talk with a therapist who turned out to be have this uh, uh, religious bent to him. His his therapy was coming from a Christian background, and it was not serving me in my existential crisis moment at all. I needed to find someone else, but I couldn't get back that money. I couldn't get back that time. And so um, we set up that secular therapy project to ensure that uh, the people that uh, the professionals that I am connected with um, have uh, are uh, do not have that religious um, bent to them. That uh, uh, yeah, the, yeah, I think I think that makes sense. Right now, we have over 550 vetted therapists in the directory. So Secular Therapy Project isn't providing the therapy directly. Instead, I, as a client, and we've got well over 25,000 clients in the database, I, as a client, am able to go to seculartherapy.org, create an account, and put in my zip code here in the U.S. and search for local therapists near me. I can even search statewide to um, have some telehealth as well. So it is a fantastic resource for folks who are looking for uh, prof uh, professional mental um, health uh, done. Uh, yeah, searching for those some someone to talk to in a professional manner. I would encourage you guys to check that out. Check out seculartherapy.org, create an account and kind of poke around, see who's near you, um, see how it works. It is, uh, the, the priority is both to, is a lot for confidentiality. You're, we have this messaging service that you're able to connect um, and speak with the uh, therapist before you even commit to uh, signing up for a, a session. There's also a lot of um, background that, that the therapists write um, and the uh, therapist identities are protected as well as your own, because if it went out without uh, in a, let's say, I don't know, a, a Tennessee um, city that this therapist is secular, they may not <laughs> be able to practice much longer um, because of how religious it is uh, out there. And so both ends are really protected until we're ready to connect and, and talk with one another. So that's the Secular Therapy Project. Um, check it out at seculartherapy.org. The other service that we offer is an online community. So it's very, very similar to the society that you guys have here, but it's got a slightly different bent to it. Um, this is all through the uh, program called Slack. It's uh, kind of been used as like a workforce type of program where teams of, of employees can connect with one another, but we've sort of transformed it into a community, almost like Discord, but not quite. Um, this is not publicly accessible, has to be invited. If I am interested in joining the Recovering from Religion online community, I'll go to the helpline and uh, say, hey, I'm interested in this. And uh, the agent will ask me a few questions to see if I'm a good fit and then send me an invite. Um, what's really neat about the online community is that it's got a ton of different channels, a ton of different chat rooms, if uh, you're old like I am and understand what chat rooms are. Um, and each chat room is 
different from the next, uh, and they focus on some very specific topics. For example, I'm, I'm not, but if I uh, was an ex-military, if I was a veteran, or even a current military, there is a military channel, and we can I can get put into this military channel and uh, talk to other folks who have experienced um, similar experiences to me uh, as a non-believer in the military. If I'm an ex-Mormon or an ex-Muslim, uh, LGBT individual, uh, or even a secular parent, and for the first time, like, what am I going to do here? There are channels for each one of those. And I'm able to hop into one of these and connect to people who have had similar experiences to myself. Uh, so uh, taking that back from me, I, I am not ex-Mormon. I am not ex-Muslim and uh, not LGBT individual. And so... If I were to um, communicate with one of them, yeah, we can communicate, but I wouldn't fully understand what these folks have been through. And so to have other people around them to who have been through some very, very similar experiences is really, really powerful. And so that's why we have set up the online community. All right. Uh, and, and it's all anonymous again. And so this is a, another good space for folks to kind of talk uh, privately and securely and safely about their what they've been going through. So the resources program, I think I skipped a little bit too far ahead. Is that right? Yep. Yep. The resources program. Great. This is a team of volunteers who um, curate the library of resources that we have and the website that we have. This includes finding new rate resources or weeding out any broken leaks. In fact, the public are able to uh, um, submit suggestions or informs of us of some broken links. But this is a very specific team whose, uh, whose job it is and work it is to uh, make sure that this uh, resource, these resources are working and they're perfect for folks who are uh, in need of some certain situations. Uh, so for example, um, let's say I've got a fear of hell. Uh, like I go to sleep and I dream of being tortured in hell or um, I have just anxiety with hell, uh, just, uh, but I no longer believe in a God or no longer believe in even a heaven. It's just this fear of hell. What if I'm wrong? I could be sent to hell. We have uh, several resources to um, walk folks through uh, and share with folks like why this may not be true, why, how to get past the fear of hell. Um, the same thing for ex any religion, ex Muslim, we've got resources for them, ex um, uh, Orthodox Jewish, we've got resources for them, secular parenting, the teens, we've got resources for them as well. Um, uh, what you won't find on here, as I had said earlier, we're not, our purpose is not to, de de uh, to deconvert folks. So you won't see things like debates on whether like, Catholicism was right or atheism is right. You won't see those kinds of things. These are um, uh, resources purely for folks who are recovering from religion. All right, outreach, recovering from religion, religion outreach. Uh, oh, uh, so back to the resources. I'd encourage you to check that out. You can get to it from uh, recoveryfromreligion.org and have a look at all of our resources that we've got there. And there are a lot of them. Currently, we're revamping it too, so it's going to be a lot easier to get through it. All right, next, RFR Outreach. Um, we do this in several ways. Uh, the blog, we have a blog called Excommunications, and you can see the link there, medium.com slash excommunications. And this is where anyone can really submit an article for review and possible publication onto our blog. But this is where we can talk about our experiences with uh, religion in the past and how it's affected us, how we're working with it now. This is a place to share our stories. And this is powerful because if I'm uh, going through my own existential crisis, struggling to kind of find my way as I no longer really believe what, I, what I'm being told, it can get dark. It can feel lonely. It can be scary. As I'm searching through the internet, I'm going to stumble across my uh, the RFR excommunications blog and read stories of, that I can really relate to. And if these people got through it, then that that dim, dim light at the end of the tunnel might get a little bit brighter and uh, give me some hope, give me a reason to, to go on and, and uh, make me feel less alone and a little bit more safe. So the blog is fantastic. And uh, I'd encourage you to check that out too. 
The next part of the outreach is RFRX. Um, uh, this is actually the show that is every Monday night, uh, and is why I've got to kind of cut uh, my talk a little bit short today and head over there because uh, it's happening tonight. But every Monday evening, we bring on guests to talk about topics um, that people who come to RFR struggle with. We have, like I mentioned earlier, there's a fear of hell. We have had folks uh, come on, uh, um, counselors and therapists come on to talk about how to deal with the fear of hell or how to set boundaries or how to create personal autonomy that you may not have ever experienced in a very controlling religious worldview. Um, and then we're on social media, all over social media to Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, you know, you name it. Um, we're all over that too. All right, uh, just about done here. One or two more slides. What has RFR meant to me? For me, I kind of touched on it earlier. I am a much better person because of the work that uh, the, the volunteering I've been doing with RFR. Um, coming out of uh, transitioning out of spirituality and religion was really, really tough. As I said, it sent me in a depression for about four years. And having a space, having these support group meetings where I can talk about, share about what I've been going through, as well as identify myself in the experiences other people have been going through too. It's just been transformative, incredibly helpful and healing for me. I am able, I've been able to deal with issues that um, have, I was struggling with for years. And this is just peer support. Um, I've been able to find counselors uh, through the Secular Therapy Project to help me out as well, both in Missouri and here in Colorado, where I now live. Um, there are incredible skills, not only communication skills that I learned and developed and honed inside of the, the uh, support groups, but also um, working with people now as a support group director and getting plugged in to uh, uh, working with so many of these amazing leaders like Jeanette and Mark, um, listening to them and when uh, being creative and working through the, the things that are coming up in the meetings. Um, it's just, I've got a lot of very valuable skills out of that too. The stories that I hear um, are, are so inspirational. Uh, the, the things, um, the things that, I, that I heard, I'll never forget in the support group meetings. I had a woman show up scared as a shaking like a little mouse and I felt uh, broken and hopeless and alone uh, in this first meeting. I watched her walk in just feeling so scared. After a few meetings, after a few months and, and having these conversations, listening to other people, she walks out with her head held high, a new hope on, and, and, and just the courage that I saw and that, that she exhibited was so inspirational to me. And it's seeing people... <laughs> <laughs> I get a little worked up, so excuse me. Seeing people just be courageous and um, battle their own demons and win is is so in inspiring to me. And it uh, and, and I, I get to meet these amazing, amazing people. And coming out of religion too, before religion, religion, I thought that uh, this deity, a God had created me and created me for a purpose. And the, the thing was, I had to go find it. It was like a hide and go seek game. Eric, you're here. Now go find your purpose. Uh, go And um, that's your meaning. You're, you've got to serve me and you got to uh, uh, praise me, uh, but you, then you've got a purpose and go find it. But coming out of religion, I realized that I flipped it around. Like I get to create my purpose. I get to create the meaning of my life. And for me, the purpose of my life is to leave this place better than I found it. Um, and my work with RFR and all of these incredible volunteers is just pursuing is, is just gives me that purpose, gives me that meaning in my life. Um, as you can well see, so that's what RFR has been done, doing for me. So I'm going to wrap this up. I think I've gone a little long and I apologize for that, but uh with recovering from religion, use us, go to the helpline, attend a support group meeting, um, check out our resources, uh, find a secular therapist when you need to, uh, volunteer with us if and when you're ready to. I got to say, when I was asked to be a support group leader, I wasn't quite ready, but I knew that if I didn't do it, <clears throat> um, 
then it wouldn't get done. And it was so needed. It's not to say that that's what you need to do, but that's how it was. That's how I saw it for myself. Volunteer, we need help in the resources. We need help with the outreach, so with the helpline and the support groups. Donate. Um, I think you can see <clears throat> just how valuable what Recovering from Religion is uh, and what it has to offer. And that gap that it fills between the worlds of belief and, and the worlds of non-belief. Uh, and then connect with us. Uh, it really, really helps if you connect with us on social media or, uh, yeah, on social media. Connect with us there, too. It really makes a gigantic difference. <clears throat> Sorry, we got a little frog in my throat. So that's it, folks. Um, I'd love to hear some of your questions if you got them. Uh, well, thank you, Eric. Thank you very much. Everybody, could you please unmute your mics now, because now we're going to open up uh, the discussion for people who have questions for Eric. Eric, very well done. I appreciate learning about what you've talked about, recovering from religion. Uh, before I start my thousand questions to you, Eric, let's hear from everybody else. Anybody have a comment or a, co a question for Eric? Comments, questions, this is the time. Take your mic off mute. This is the time to ask Eric a question. If you don't have a question, I'd, I do. Please. Well, I. You go first. Hey, Joel. Joel. Thank you. Joel. Uh, it, I was fascinated with, uh, with the story um, because it parallels my own uh, so closely. Yeah. Um, and, uh, uh, and one of the experiences that I've had is I, I, I teach a course over at the University of North Florida in their OLLI program. Uh, entitled Quest for the Historical Jesus. And uh, I have uh, lots of very, very interesting interactions with people. Uh, I'm the son of a Lutheran clergyman. My brother and my brother-in-law were both Lutheran clergymen. Uh, and, uh, but I have uh, become a very, very proactive uh, uh, atheist and uh, and there is, uh, uh, there, there are an awful lot of people out there. I, I had one attorney in, in one of my classes come up to me afterwards. He says, I had been a Catholic all of my life and it has only been now and taking this course that I begin to understand all of the questions that I've had all of my life around what I believe. Uh, so there's loads, loads of people out there looking for exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. And they need help sometimes finding it too. So I'm, uh, yeah. I'm really glad that you kind of saw a lot of yourself in that and uh, in, in my own story. And, and that's, it's the experience that I have uh, as well um, on, on your end, in your shoes, uh, the stories that I hear from others. Um, I can see myself and, in, uh, and in, in things that I went through and the, the trauma that I went through uh, in, in so many of those folks too, though, that, that connection just fosters empathy for me and wanting to do more of this kind of work. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Joel. Thank you, Joel. Uh, other comments, other questions from other folks. There's a, there's a comment in the chat from uh, Dave who says, I amen to Christian therapists. Not cool to bring it on me as a therapist. Not sure of a scientific religious conflict. Don't trust it. Eric? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh. <laughs> yeah. I. This is Dave. Hi. Yeah. Actually, I was going to hey, say, uh, I keep looking at your website, hoping I can find a bibliography or books to read about like Catholic recovery. But I, you know, I have a lot of, I have a lot of good feelings for the church, but then I find a lot of guilt and perfectionism and stuff. And I keep thinking there's gotta be a book written about this. I can't be the only one, but um, back to the therapy comment. Yeah. I had a long relationship with a woman and then uh, it, 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 we went our separate ways. She wanted children. I didn't. And then I started a, I was crushed and went to therapy and it was suffering like some kind of existential crisis. And and I realized this, one of these therapists was like, I realized after I, or I don't know if it was after anyway, the point is she kept, you know, she was like, ended every call with, well, God bless you. And uh, I was like, oh, that's funny. And, you know, and I was like, you know, and, uh, 
and she she said, well, do you think you might get back with her someday? And I said, well, maybe in the second session or first session, she goes, well, that's good. And I was like, that's good. Like, I need you to help <laughs> me figure out yeah. not to come with a verdict, you know? So yeah, that's yeah. what I was referring to. Yeah. I, I'm not this, this, uh, when I, we didn't set up the, the secular therapist is like, Hey, or the secular therapy project is like, Hey, all religious, anybody who's a Christian and a therapist, they're bad. That's not it at all. Um, uh, uh, really the point of the secular therapy project is to avoid what I experienced, wasting my money, wasting my time with a therapist who had a religious agenda and, um, uh, base their practices off of that. And so if we can save people the time that I wasted, the money that I wasted uh, by just having a, a connecting them with a pre-vetted therapist, then uh, I, I think that's a positive thing uh, completely. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Well, but, but, but in terms of the, the therapy, this is something that intrigued me uh, in terms of the growth as a personal ind individual and the idea that you, we are not alone and we're looking for people mm -hmm. who believe like, and we want to belong to a groups that think similarly to us. And we want to feel like there are others who share similar thoughts as us, as we do. In the, in the absence of that, the, the, uh, the thing is that we tend to believe that people fail short as being a person. If they can't find a, a group that, in which they can believe and belong to, or they can't find a group that has similar views to themselves, this is a therapeutic problem. We're all social creatures, we get that. But you know what the idea of feeling alone sometimes can be a good thing. Okay, cool. <laughs> I uh, yes, there are times where feeling alone is uh, beneficial, uh, it, I, but I see it as a driver. Um, and also as almost an alarm and an indicator. Why do I feel alone? This is raising a flag in my head. There's something going on and I'd like to identify what it is and work on it. Is that kind of what you're suggesting? I'm, I'm suggesting the idea that, that we need to believe and belong in something, even if it's the absence of oh. theism or the absence of religion, that's something to believe in. And, and we as humans are looking for something to believe and belong in. And the absence of having that something to believe and belong in is viewed as a problem. I think it's a problem when it starts to affect us on a daily um, yeah, on a on a daily basis. Uh, if if my thoughts are getting darker and darker and darker because I'm feeling more and more alone, and that nobody can understand what I'm going through, uh, and that it's it's scary in that world. If that's uh, the type of alone that I'm feeling um, in a negative and impactful way, then I don't think that's okay. I think that um, uh, it's not healthy. It's, it's uh, not uh, productive and it could be destructive, but if I'm satisfied and, and happy being alone, then absolutely. That's, that's a, that's a very, that's a positive thing. No need to force that on somebody else. Well, Hey, you don't have any friends here, 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 go have a friend, go have a friend here. Here's a friend. I'll be your friend. Oh, no, that's not necessary at all. And if they're happy where they're at. Um, I know for me uh, and, and a lot of other people who have um, attended the support group meeting and the helpline uh, feeling alone is, is a, incredibly vulnerable thing at times. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, uh, and I think that perhaps several of the folks here in the meeting can kind of attest to that too. Just, um, who can I turn to? No one is safe. Who can I talk to, uh, that can understand and has been through what I've been through and, um, knowing that those types of people are out there, uh, is just a long way into helping, uh, ease, my mind and and he's the minds of those other folks who are going through the same thing and i can add and i don't know i don't know if mark can support this mark may already have had to sign off 
But as a, um, as a support group leader, I can tell you that most of the people coming on that, that are still trying to find their footing, they're desperate for mm -hmm. community. And, yeah. and that's why, that's why I'm surprised that we don't have a bigger group that meets for the secular Sunday with, you know, Fred's group in the park. I, that surprises me because so many people are looking for that type of thing. Um, I don't know if it's just, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if it's the wrong day or the wrong time or whatever, but, um, but when but with on the support group, most of the people are looking for they, most of them don't have family that they can talk to and and they're and they're lonely, quite frankly, and just looking for a place to talk. That's yeah. my personal experience almost ninety nine percent of the time. Well, and you're absolutely right too. Uh, and and the people who are okay with being alone, they're not seeking out the the hell the services of recovering from religion either um and so uh i'm uh, they're they're just fine uh, the people who are in pain and um uh are struggling are those who are seeking and searching for what um, folks like jeanette and mark are doing yeah they just want a place to talk where they know they can talk and not be judged yeah a place that, that they can go they can feel comfortable being themselves. I it's let so me just say one other thing that you didn't mention in your in your mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. presentation, which was outstanding, um, is that just the way that we record our monthly meetings so that people could go back and go to the first case free thought website and go back and look at past um, meetings or presentations. Every one of their Monday, every one of Recovery from Religion's past programs, every one of their Monday events is recorded and can be um, can be watched. Right, you know, at any point they have a full library, and you can scroll through. They have some amazing speakers. I can. They're just some great programs that they offer every Monday. I don't know how they do it, but they do. And um, I can't imagine, as I just have to come up with a person once a month and it's a hard thing to do. And I don't know how you guys <laughs> do it every Monday night, but man, Deez's program was outstanding. I, you guys have just put on some amazingly good programs. And I just wanted, mostly, you know, you're pretty much singing to the choir with our group. You know, mm -hmm. that's why they're part of First Guys Free Thought. What I really want them to know is that they know people if they if they talk to people who don't understand or are searching, this is an outstanding resource to help direct people to and to promote a place that they can go to and and find um, where they're not talking to people who are trying to convince them to leave religion, but they're they can go to and find somebody to just listen to them as they work through their own thought processes, whether they stay with it or don't. So that's what I wanted our group to understand that this is an outstanding program. And if you know people that are struggling with religion, you can send them to Recovering From Religion. It's an extremely, um, Effective. They've just got some great programs, and I and I'm I'm losing my ability to talk. I guess, well, but well, at any rate. Well, thanks, Jeanette, for finding Eric and bringing him to us. We appreciate it very much. Are there other comments or questions for Eric? Um, other comments or questions for Eric? We only have a few more minutes left, so this is the time to speak up, speak now, or I'm going to ask him another question. Speak now. This is not a threat, but I'm going to ask Eric another question. <laughs> Get ready, Eric. All right, Eric. Hearing nothing from the from our audience, I, I really appreciate everybody being here. But Eric, as you move forward in in, in the organization, 
to which you uh, uh, represent. Uh, what are your individual personal challenges with the organization and with the organization as it represents itself? Um, just with like any other organization, uh, money and and people. Uh, the more funds that we have access to, the more things that we can do. Um, uh, we we've, we've been grateful, uh, lucky enough to have received a few grants in the past uh, few years, and uh, has enabled us to do uh, some marketing. Uh, as you probably can imagine, I. Think think that um, uh, there there are organizations out there that put bill secular organizations that put billboards up like the American atheists or I think the the, the Polk County free thinkers did the something similar to down in in Florida um, but we we're, we were able to use those funds for kind of marketing and social media um, some other challenges are volunteers uh, we can always use more and more volunteers. 2020, when we went into lockdown, saw an explosion of need uh, with people stuck in their homes, not, a, not attending church on a regular basis. You'd be surprised at how quickly people begin to doubt and start to think for themselves when they don't go to religion on a weekly basis or bi-weekly basis, when they go, don't go to church. It it's, starts to break down fast. <laughs> But um, so we had an influx of people coming to the helpline and uh, a, a skyrocket influx of people coming to the support groups. RFRX, that um, Monday night discussion uh, series, uh, that was born out of it as a way to talk about these um, issues that people struggle with. We saw an increase in volunteers and support group leaders um, through that too, but it, it's growing. It's growing. Um, uh, we're currently working on a... Uh, a uh, project called RFR 3.0, where we're taking, um, we're working to get out of the Slack workspace and uh, program and platform that we're using and trying to custom build something for um, recovery from religion to suit all of its needs instead of patchworking things together. So uh, I'm in need of video editors to edit video, the RFRXs, and put them on YouTube every week. I'm getting a little behind on that because uh, I'm I'm the the one responsible for editing them. Uh, I could use some schedulers to respond to emails and and uh, uh, schedule guests um, for these Monday nights. So, um, I, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Those are the challenges. Okay. Some. Yeah. You you have personal challenges. The what are my personal challenges relative to the organization? I um, struggle to find enough time to do all this work because I wish I could get paid to do it. So my personal challenges, honestly, I'm an introvert. I am more mission driven than people driven. And um, so for me, it's working with people uh, is, is a challenge. It's not to say anything bad about the support group leaders because these people are amazing, as you well know with Jeanette. Uh, but just personally, I have had to, if you had met me 20 years ago, I could not have possibly um, done what I do with uh, recovering from religion. Uh, I'm a completely different person. I've learned so many uh, skills, uh, but I still struggle <laughs> working with people because I would much rather be in a corner reading a book by myself or something. Um, but uh, uh, because I love what we do and I've been impacted by it so much and can totally understand my um, desire to make the world a better place, uh, to leave it better than I found it, far outweighs um, the, uh, the struggles I have it, uh, with, with just working with people. Um, I, does that answer that question? I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I appreciate. Okay. I appreciate it. Yeah, I really do. I appreciate you being candid with us and, and talking. Oh yeah. From your heart, you know, this would seem yeah. like. To me. So, but let's let's add, let's open it up again. Are, are other comments? Any comments? Questions for Eric? <laughs> Any comments you know, or questions? Well, just a uh, comment. Yeah, did you find that um, the. Uh, more people from the say small towns or big cities or it's kind of a big mix of both or from geographically uh it's it's a mix of both um 
Yeah, it's a mix of both. The groups tend to be uh, large city oriented. Um, and right now we're all we're meeting all virtually. Uh, and so it's all over Zoom, which is fantastic and gives access to the uh, the people in the rural areas. But before COVID, before we were meeting virtually, we met in person, in a space, in a library or in a coffee shop. And I know that more often than not, I, uh, people will travel like well over two hours just to get a meeting, get to a meeting. Uh, we had a support group meeting in Springfield and people would drive from Branson. People would drive um, from West Plains just to attend this support group meeting. They are so, in, they're, they're suffering, they're in pain, and they're incredibly motivated to talk to someone uh, about what's been going on. So uh, uh I, I know that you asked like what's kind of the makeup rural or, or, or uh, urban um, and it's, it's a mixture of both um, and it, people are motivated to just attend. <laughs> Excellent question. Any, any other questions, questions, comments? Other questions, a follow up, Fred? Anybody else who hasn't had the opportunity to speak? This is, the, this is your opportunity because Eric is going to be leaving us in just a couple of minutes. I was going to comment that I, uh, I was in the Navy myself for a few years, and I did become aware of the military atheist uh, group. Yeah. And actually, one of Mikey. my nephews uh, is, you know, he's been in the Air Force almost, you know, over 15 years now, and, I, and he's uh, part of that also. I haven't seen him in a long time, but um, you know, I've mean, I mean, had any affiliation with, with, that, with that group. Uh, no, uh, they're they're independent. They're like the Freedom from Religion Foundation, but specifically for uh, the military. Uh, what is the military? Oh, for, I was just talking with Mikey the other day. Um, uh, I'm hoping to have him on a guest at, on the um, RFRX uh, sometime this summer uh, to kind of introduce us to what uh, what all his organization does. I I'm blanking on the organization, but uh, we don't. But other than that, uh, we don't have much of a connection. Mm -hmm. Eric, how much time do you spend with uh, recovering from religion? Uh, this will be my seventh year. No, I mean, asking... like, like in a year, in terms of if you had to, <laughs> if you had to sign in on a timesheet. All right. Uh, yeah, so me personally, <laughs> me personally, I probably put um, close to thirty or forty hours into it, um, uh, For but. What? Per what? Per year? Per year? Per, per, per week. Per week. Per week. Okay. All right. All right. But um, that is way more than um, uh, any volunteer needs to give. Uh, um, support group leaders, um, about four hours a month is really the bare minimum. And that, same, that goes for the helpline too, um, uh, as well. Mm -hmm. So don't don't look at me like uh, an example of like, oh, if I volunteer, that's how much time I have to give. No, no, that's not at all. <laughs> Oh, we, we, we don't have that problem. <laughs> nobody, nobody's saying, I, I wish I could give 30, 40 hours a week. But no, we, we do have, it's interesting though, how, may, how much time people do spend and where it reaches their heart and yeah. why this is important to yeah. give us their time. That's, and, and for anybody who gives the time voluntarily to an organization, that, that like the First Coast Free Fall Society or the Recovering from Religion organization, we only can show gratitude to them for their yeah. time. You know, and we've got some great people on our side that have given lots of time. So uh, I'm just curious if uh, how you how you quantified that. It's it's interesting to me, um, but let be. But beyond my interest, because I could I could talk with Eric for another month, <laughs> two months. But before we close out, this is your chance. Any any last questions, comments? Sign if you're. Oh, Joel, you're muted. Understand you're muted. If you're speaking, you're actually muted. So unmute yourselves and get ready for a show of applause. <laughs> Unless you have something. Okay. There you go, Joel. Yeah, I just wanna pick up uh, on something that uh, Eric said and, and Jeanette said as well. And that is, um, it's, it strikes me that 
many of these people uh, still have something about Sunday morning. Uh, you know, it, it's when they went to church, it's when they grow up, you know, it's Sunday morning is, is the time. And, uh, and then Eric's comment about really the, and, and Jeanette's comment about the fact that this, these people are searching for uh, a, a sense of belonging, a group where they feel safe, uh, that they can just really mm -hmm. let it all out and, and people will listen. And um, uh, I, I think we, uh, our group uh, really should take a look at, at Sunday morning, uh, second or Sunday, and, and find a place uh, and, and uh, find a way, j just like the meetup that wound up with 11 people showing up, uh, find a way to keep the message out there that on Sunday mornings, there's a place you can come and you can ask your questions. You can, can uh, sit and listen uh, and, and understand that there are so many other people out there uh, of a like mind and uh, dealing with uh, many of the same questions. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Joel, for that. That's, that's uh, very poignant. I appreciate it. Uh, there are alternatives right here locally. And now we're all on Zoom and we're actually across the, the country. We have people that are not local to Florida who are on our Zoom chat. Uh, and we appreciate everybody who's ever given a donation, given their time and just shown up for a meeting. We appreciate your time, your efforts, your, co your communication, your questions, your donations. Eric, I know you said you had to leave uh, yeah. earlier than we were hoping. Uh, but because uh, 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 we wanted to drill you a little further, but we're not going, we're going to spare you that. Uh, and uh, tell us where you're going, because you're going to another Zoom. Yeah. Meeting, right? yeah. Um, before I leave, um, and it's uh, the RFRX is starting in 10 minutes or so. Uh, before I leave, I wanted to do two things. First, make the distinction um, between what RFR does and a secular community group like yours, like yourselves, uh, like the free. First Coast Free Thought Society. We are not a community group. Recovering from Religion will never be a community group. It's never going to be an activism group. It's never going to be a community service group at all or organization. Um, uh, re recovering from Religion will never be that. In fact, instead, it'll be a support organization. And so we work so well with local secular communities um, because uh, so many of those secular communities don't have a support type of access uh, or, or program with them. They'll do community service. They'll do activism service. They'll they'll have a um, uh, a social aspect to them, of course, and that's incredibly important. And so, working with the secular communities um, around the world is just fantastic to be able to provide that piece to their members. And and I and I say that because yes. I come on here and, and I come to and talk to several groups, uh, to uh, local groups about like, hey, this is what RFR is. If you know of somebody, uh, let them know about us. Um, yeah, I do that. But I also want to talk to you individual as, as the members, just because you're already out, you're already um past the and have transitioned out of religion doesn't mean that there are things you're not struggling with. Um, I know for me, 10 years on, 12 years on, I'm still struggling with my uh, things that I was indoctrinated with in the past, within the past, uh, my past religious experiences and stuff. Um, let's say when when you hear the word gay, you kind of start to cringe um, uh, and like there's something going on inside that may be part of your past indoctrination. And I would suggest talking to the helpline, coming to a support group, looking at our resources to maybe give you a different view uh, and to kind of work through that um, cringy type of feeling or that, um, uh, uh, you know, that little bit of dread that you might feel um, when, when uh, certain things come up and you can trace it back to your past religious indoctrination. So not only, like I said, not only is it for you, 
you to tell other folks about what RFR does, but for you personally too, it can help with some things that you're struggling with. So folks, thank you so, so much for inviting me on here. I'm going to be heading to RFRx Talks and, um, like I said, it happens every Monday night. And tonight we have Rachel Roberts on and she'll be talking about secular spirituality, kind of taking some of the trappings of your old uh, old religious um, views of uh, spirituality and how can we translate it and adapt it to our, our new or uh, current secular worldview and stuff. So it, I'm looking forward to what she has to say. <laughs> so well, folks, again, thank you very, very much. Well, thank you, Eric. Thank you, Eric. Um, and let, let, me, let me close by quoting something from the chat room. Uh, we, we have chats uh, and, and, and Bobby says, sounds like a wonderful organization, exclamation point. So glad you're out there helping people. Yeah, that, that, that's what it's about, isn't it? And I love, Eric, your personal mantra which is, uh, I, uh, for, forgive me if I'm paraphrasing, leave this place better than I found it. Yeah. Is that, that it? That nailed it. That You nailed it. You nailed it. How can anyone argue with that? I don't get it. <laughs> you can try. Uh, I'd you... love <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> All right. So unmute your mics, please. And, and as we say goodnight, or, you know, you do the, this, uh, the, the ASL, this is ASL for <laughs> applause. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Eric, very much. We very My much pleasure. appreciate your time, your expertise. Thank you, everyone. And your heartfelt comments. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Eric. Thank Bye, you. guys. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Eric. All right, Have Madeline. Good night. Good night. Thanks, <laughs> Madeline. Take care. Thank you all. Uh, Great job. <laughs>